Welcome everybody to our ninth lecture in the course on orthodoxy in the Russian Empire. And today we're going to continue our look at the way orthodoxy and certain sections of the population interacted. Today's focus indeed is how one of the biggest population groups of the Russian Empire interacted with orthodoxy, that is to say women in the Russian Empire. Now, I want to state very clearly to begin with, and I'm sure I'm going to reiterate this point several times over the course of a lecture, that women did not represent a single unified group in Imperial Russia, any more than women truly represent a single unified group today. Women were dispersed among numerous social estates. They possessed differing levels of economic resources, and they possessed differing levels of political power, ranging from peasant women, who were conspicuously powerless in almost every respect, ranging up to the female empresses who ruled Russia in the 18th century, exercising almost absolute power over both their female and male subjects. With this caveat in mind, however, there were some things which did unify women as a group. The church's perspective on them, for instance, and the various tools the church began to deploy, especially in the late 19th century, to educate both its own women, that is to say women in the clerical estate, and women beyond it. And we're going to consider that today. However, before we move on to that, I would like to open by making um, a few conceptual remarks, looking at the ways in which historians have conceptualized, um, firstly, gender history overall, and secondly, the role of women in both Christianity and in the Russian Empire. This, I hope, will give us the necessary theoretical and empirical basis to begin our second half of a lecture, lecture, where we look more in detail at the, particip at the participation of women in the church and the church's attitude, changing attitude towards them. So we're going to open with a little discussion about gender theory and how it is informing the views of historians writing on the subjects of women in the Russian Empire. Now I want to make it very, very clear, I am not an expert on gender theory. I'm sure there are many great classes for my students here at Tartu, um, and for those of you who are watching on the internet, I'm sure you can find a much, much better introductions and detailed discussions elsewhere on the internet. However, I do think it is necessary just to give a very brief overview, because this is precisely the lens which historians of all kinds are employing when looking at gender history, not just in Russia, but in Europe and the rest of the world as a whole. So generally, the, the most important outcome of gender theory has been thus, that we can generally divide sex and gender. It is argued that sex is, a biolog is the biological fact. This relates to your sexual organs and other differing parts of, your, uh, parts of the biology uh, and other parts of your biology that differ depending on whether you are born male or female. Now, I just want to comment that I'm aware um, that trans and queer theorists how, are in the process of questioning this division. However, I am certainly not the right person to discuss this issue. This issue. I lack, uh, I am certainly on the level of knowledge I can give you very little insight into this, but I just would like to say that this is now being questioned to an extent by some theorists. But nonetheless, this sort of um, classical division still holds for most historians examining this period. So firstly, then we have sex pertaining to biological facts. And secondly, we have what is called gender. And gender is believed to be the cultural attributes of men and women. That is to say, the, um, the qualities, the values, 
the talents, the skills which a given culture at a given point attributes to each of the genders. Now, of course, one of the most revolutionary parts of this, uh, of this division between sex and gender is it reveals that gender is not a fixed component, indeed a uh, fixed quality, but rather it is something that is subject to constant change. And that change can be uh, both in terms of chronological change over time, and also in terms of geographical, spatial change. So different cultures in different places all over the world can attribute different values to their conceptions of gender. Often we find that notions of femininity and masculinity exist in a mutually opposed but also symbiotic relationship. What I mean by that is that our notions of what constitute femininity, the feminine gender, and those which con uh, constitute the masculine, uh, the masculine gender, are often held to be uh, diametrically opposite. Just to you, give you one instance which was very influential in European history from the mid-18th all the way until at least the 1960s in some areas still is influential, is the notion of um, domestic and public. Domestic is considered to be, has been considered to be a value that is inherently feminine. Whereas public has been a value that has been attributed to men. And these are two uh, diametrically opposite poles. However, as that this means that as the two, as one changes, as for instance, so to say, as let's say a notion of masculinity changes, the notion of femininity changes as well. So this is to say, this is what I mean by being in an opposed but symbiotic relationship. They represent values attributed to men and women often represent opposite poles of each other, but they um, change with each other as well. Generally speaking, in European history over the last, well, couple of thousand years really, especially with the influence of Christianity and the Roman legal code and so on and so forth, generally speaking, masculinity and the masculine has been assumed to be the norm. That is to say, it is the normal state of things. Whereas femininity is often discussed um, as being some kind of deviation from the norm, or something beyond the norm, or, lack, or lacking in comparison to the norm. This, of course, is given direct expression in patriarchal European societies exercising creating structures of misogynistic inequality and exercising a huge amount of control over female behaviors. And these concepts of gender, these way, the ways in which we create in different contexts at different times, a notion of gender has often used to give, to give shape, systems of inequality, while also being shaped by those systems. Now, of course, the most obvious example we can choose is the, exact, is the precise relationship, political power relationship between male and female that has existed throughout much of modern European history, with men generally possessing most of the political, economic, and social power, with women being very much uh, a group subordinated to male control. However, we can, talk in different, we can talk in some other ways as well. For instance, the Orientalist scholar Edward Said makes very clear the point that the, um, the imperial Western powers, particularly Britain and France, he has in mind, when they looked at the Middle East and Eastern cultures, they often coded them as feminine and themselves as masculine in order to justify 
and uh, an oppressive imperial relationship, an oppressive and unequal imperial relationship between these two geographical areas. Now, I'd like to move on from this general um, conceptualization to looking at women in Christianity. And we're going to see how religious values attributed to the notion of the feminine, religious values have, um, have changed. So religious values attributed to women have changed. The gender coding of religious values has changed over time. Now, I just want to give a very brief overview at sort of the, the very briefly, the theological basis of Christianity's attitude to women. And I should note before I even begin this, that this is a subject of intense debate between theologians, church actors, academics, biblical scholars, and indeed still today, political actors. For some, the Bible and other key Christian texts are inherently misogynistic, justifying male oppression of women. And they point to numerous examples throughout the Old and New Testament. Some might say, for instance, that the creation of Eve II from a part taken from Adam is suggestive or indicative of a biblical view on women as coming second, as being inferior and reliant on men for their, for the very, um, for in their very creation. Others might point to the way in which Eve, in the same story in Genesis, is the one who, fall, who, is, who is falls um, for the tricks of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, therefore thereby condemning humanity to centuries, um, to an eternity of living in a fallen, sinful state. But others take, um, would take issue with these interpretations. For instance, some would say Adam's statement directly after the creation of Eve, flesh of my flesh, could imply an equality. In this, uh, some kind of equality in this, fundament, in this uh, fundamental creation story of the Christian faith. Now, when we come to the New Testament, we find equally contradictory evidence. On the one hand, women play an important part in Christ's ministry as it's depicted in the New Testament. The Virgin Mary, of course, is a key figure, as is Mary Magdalene. And indeed, the fact that she is depicted as the first one to witness Christ's resurrection seems to emphasize and underline a special role for her in particular, but even for women in general within the early ministry of Christ. Now, one of the huge bases within the New Testament for later views on women and their role in Christianity and the church are the gospel, is the gospel of St. Paul. And here there's a problem because the gospel of St. Paul is inherently contradictory. This is most likely because it was written by more than one author. And if you're interested in that, I'm sure you can pick, go and pick up a book uh, by a biblical scholar looking at authorship in the Bible. But in any case, at one point, for instance, Paul seems to imply that women are in leadership positions in the early Christian church. He writes letters to women who hold the position of deaconess. So in other words, they were ordained church people. They would received ordination and risen to the lowest rank in the clerical hierarchy. His letters also mention other activities by female religious leaders heading their new Christian communities in cities throughout the Roman uh, Mediterranean. On the other hand, there are sections where Paul strictly seems to strictly limit 
the role of women in Christianity and the church. I've given you one of the most famous quotations here from 1 Corinthians 14, 33, 35. Women should remain silent in churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Now in reality, you can see why there has been such an area, for, uh, such room for debate about the view on women contained in the foundational documents of the church. On the one hand, you have many feminists uh, and others who would argue that these, these texts are inherently anti-women, inherently misogynistic, and others, and for instance, there are um, such as um, theologians who argue for a feminist interpretation of the scripture, and there is an entire school of such theologians that exists, argue for a more balanced picture, um, often one rooted in examining the metaphorical meanings of the texts, or looking at biblical scholarship to try and identify um, the reasons for these day conflicting utterances. However, I don't think there is anybody who would deny that in the subsequent 1,900 years, Christianity and its church structures, be they Catholic, Protestant, or Orthodox, have largely supported the suppression of women, the denial of equality for women, and have used their texts to justify their texts and their priesthoods to justify that inequality. Now, gender in Christianity has undergone a flux of a time. As I said, gender is a contingent cultural social factor that changes in terms of time and geography. Now, if we look, very generally speaking, at medieval saints' lives of women, we can see this precisely. In, med in the medieval period, religious values were coded as being inherently masculine. That is to say, they were deemed piety, zeal in, zeal in the defense of the faith, and so on and so forth, were often considered to be inherently masculine qualities. And thus when we read some medieval saints' lives of women, of female saints, we see that when the code, uh, these coded values are attributed to them, the stories depict them as change, almost changing their gender. For instance, growing beards, losing their breasts. They essentially become, through, their, through taking on a coded male value, their bodies transform into a, into a male version. And it should also be noted, following especially from uh, this story of Eve taking the apple from the, uh, from the serpent, that women in the same period were often coded as being uh, inherently sinful, especially in sexual terms. Lust was an inherently uh, was coded as inherently female, for instance. And women were often depicted as being the principal obstacles on male paths to holiness and sainthood. In this period, therefore, men are judged to be the quote-unquote naturally pious, naturally religious gender whereas women are coded as an almost naturally sinful, almost inherently lustful group. But this seems to change, or at least this has been the observation of historians looking at uh, religion from about the mid to late 18th century onwards. Firstly, there seems to be a noted behavioural change in many European countries of the time. That is, that male church attendance 
decreases and female church attendance seems to increase. Now there's a great deal of debate about why that is the case, but certainly this has been noted by scholars working on many different countries in different confessional contexts, i.e. looking at Orthodox, Protestant and Catholic countries. Now there are also cultural changes linked to and perhaps causing this behavioural change. One was the increasing rise of a certain middle-class attitude to society. A division of society into strict spheres of outer and inner. Into the outer world of politics, society, the economy, and the inner world, the domestic world, the world of the household. And as the 18th century turns into the 19th century, throughout Europe there is a very strong coding of these two spheres. The outer world, the outer sphere of politics, of political life, economic life, is increasingly coded as masculine. While the inner world, the domestic world, the world of child rearing, of cookery and so on and so forth, is coded inherently as female, as feminine. At the same time, there is a change of view about how emotion and emotional expression is coded in gender terms. As men are for, uh, pushed into assuming this political, social role in the outer world, as part of their identity as, uh, uh, as men. They begin to code emotionality as something inherently fe feminine, inherently female. At the same time, they code reservedness, um, stoicism, emotional closeness as being inherently masculine qualities. And religious strength of feeling, things like piety, piety, zeal, religious ecstasy and so on and so forth, these are expressions of emotion. So religion is increasingly, religious values are increasingly coded as feminine in change from an earlier period from the early period, where they were coded as masculine. The result is that in the 19th century, there is a real cultural shift in that most writings now start to regard women as being the most naturally, quote-unquote, religious group, the most naturally pious group. With men, now often tending to be represented much more in the sort of um, role of being inherently sinful or inherently sexual beings. I mean, certainly you can think about this in terms of throughout, the, especially in the second half of the 19th century, you often have the trope of a pious, in many novels and works of art, the, the trope of a pious woman saving a fallen man. Now, I just want to make it clear. We still are not sure whether this so-called feminization of religion occurs within the Russian Empire or not in this, in this period. Unfortunately, it's still a subject in need, in need of a great deal of study. Some early signs suggest yes, others suggest perhaps not. There's still a need for a large comprehensive study of this subject, of attitudes towards gender and religion and orthodoxy in particular in the Russian Empire of the 19th and early 20th, 20th centuries. However, I think I'll just try and give you as much as I can an overview of the latest scholarship on this matter.
Now, of course, I should begin with the very basic empirical facts. The status of women in the Russian Empire and how that changed over the course of the 18th and 19th centuries. The Russian Empire, like every other European, and indeed like most international states in this time period, is absolutely patriarchal. Men in all social estates have power over women in those groups. A nobleman has power over his daughters and uh, wife, uh, over his daughter and wife. A merchant has power and authority over his wife and uh, daughters. A peasant, peasant man has authority over his wife and daughters. And this authority was not just passive or culturally enforced. It was real legal power. Women, for instance, needed the commission of their male kin if they wanted to move, if they wanted to marry, or if they, want, um, if they wanted later in the empire in the 19th century, if they wanted to take a job. They needed a signature either from, usually from their husband or from their fathers. Generally speaking, one expression of women's lesser political, social, and economic role in the Russian Empire was the failure to take female education seriously until much later. Now, Peter the Great had invested an inordinate amount, a huge amount of time in male education in his empire, and it continued to be. Um, on uh, male education on all levels, indeed, into his empire. Certainly not all of his schemes came to realization, but there was a massive investment of time. However, for women, even in the nobility, it took until 1764, that is to say the reign of Catherine the Great, for the first uh, noble women's school to be opened. Uh, that's of the famous Smolny Institute in St. Petersburg, where, as 150 years later, Lenin was to um, launch his revolution from. Now, it does have to be said. By the, uh, end of the, by, the beginning of the 20, by the beginning of the 19th century, most, most Russian women who belonged to the noble estate had gained literacy and some degree of education. After all, being Europeanized, being educated was a key part of their marriage strategies. However, for other groups, like the clergy, merchantry, townsmen, they had to wait much, much later into the 19th century for them to receive similar female educational institutions. And this again returns to the point I made at the very beginning of this lecture. Women were not a homogenous group in the Russian Empire. They were divided among firstly social estates, but also among religious groups, among linguistic groups, and so on and so forth. So for instance, noble and merchant women in the Russian Empire, thanks to laws passed by Peter the Great and his immediate successors, had one right which was actually quite unusual for the time, which was they were allowed to own property. They could inherit property if they were the uh, last legal heir of their father or husband, which meant that noble and merchant women could hope, in the event of the death of their nearest male relatives, to having something like an independent material existence that was not reliant on men within their social estates. But the uh, Russian law code was, throughout the 18th, 19th and early 20th centuries, always concerned with policing the sexual morality and behaviour of women. In the 18th century, so-called deviant sexual behavior, 
could be met with corporate punishment and exile. This changed by the middle of the 19th century when the Russian Empire, following the French example, decided to legalize prostitution. But the reason it legalized prostitution was precisely because it believed that by legalizing it, it would be able to extend a greater control over these quote-unquote deviant women's bodies and sexual, and sexual activities. To become a legal prostitute in, in Russia, you had to go to a medical test, uh, regularly, an invasive me medical test regularly, in order to be, receive your certification that you were a legalized, a legal prostitute. Now, much of this changes from the 1860s, the Great Reforms, which impacted women as much as it impacted other spheres of the Russian Empire. One of the major ways it did this was in the case of education. In 1858, the first secondary school, gymnasiums for women, opened. And these spread across the Russian Empire quite rapidly, offering education not just to um, noble women, but also to women from the middle class, from the middle, from the emerging middle classes and the merchantry as well. For women with greater ambitions, universities began haphazardly to open their doors. So the first attempt was at the University of St. Petersburg in 1859 to 1863, allowing women to audit, their, uh, to audit the classes. Now, I don't want to go through this blow by blow, situ this situation blow by blow. Basically, universities are forced by the imperial state to cons con uh, constantly change their rules on admission to women. So, in 1863, St. Petersburg was forced to abandon this model. Then in the 1870s, as you can see here in the example of Kazan and St. Petersburg and Kiev, uh, women were once again allowed to audit courses. Then this was stopped in the 1880s by Alexander III. And again, it was reactivated. Uh, uh, women participation in universities was activated again uh, at the very end and the, and the very beginning of, a of the, uh, the end of the 19th century and the very beginning of the 20th century. But what should be noted is that in many ways, these universities and many of these new schools that were coming into being for women were principally offering them tuition and education in a select number of spheres. Medicine, pedagogy, homemaking, handicrafts, in other words, women were getting more education in these spheres, and many of them were becoming doctors, teachers, nurses. But this was because it was, these roles were judged to be suitable for them. These medical, teaching, caring professions were judged to suit the allegedly inherent female qualities of tenderness, motherhood, care, and so on and so forth. In other words, female education and employment was, was simply judged to be an extension, a minor extension of their traditional roles from the domestic sphere into the public sphere. And just in case I, don't, I forget, we should also note that this is a period of change as well for even peasant women seeking education. By the end of, uh, by the, end of the 19th century, 21.3% of the uh, over 3 million pupils in primary schools were women. And this was a considerable increase from the mere 8% That had been the case about 40 years previously. Equally, 
as new ideas began to flow into Russia in the 1860s, as educational changes uh, among women began to have their impact, we find women taking on new political roles within the Russian Empire, embracing new political ideologies. One of the most famous such groups, I use the, group, the term group lightly, were the so-called female nihilists. Uh, that is to say, uh, young women who joined the radical and revolutionary intelligentsia. Often they rejected traditional notions of womanhood and the family, rejecting traditional attributes of femininity. So for instance, most famously, cutting their hair very short and wearing bland, unflattering dresses. And generally speaking, attempting to challenge from a radical and feminist perspective, the imperial social order. And some of these women did indeed play a vital role in the radical and revolutionary movements between the 1860s and 1917. Most famously, Vera Zazulic, a correspondent who corresponded with Marx, assassinated a governor in, as part of her revolutionary activism in the 1870s. At the same time, the expanding imperial cities were almost um, were playing a similar role for women as they were uh, for working class women as they were for working class men. Women earning their own salaries in the factories could, to an extent at any rate, afford an independent, self-reliant life. And they were able to experience the new forums um, of activity, of entertainment, made available in the cities. Many of them, passed in post-1905, became involved in uh, with revolutionary or at least socially radical, social radical parties. And indeed, in February 1917, it was the striking industrial women of St. Petersburg who caused the first tremor in the earthquake that was to lead to, Saint, uh, to the overthrow of the Romanov regime. Equally, they were not just radical and revolutionary perspectives on women's political position and the social order, but also more liberal ones. In 1905, this took the form of the Union for Women's Equality, which was demanding much the same that, uh, as suffragan, uh, suffragette movements throughout Europe were demanding at this time. The votes, equality, equality in law, equality in terms of the right to property ownership, etc., etc. Now, before we move on, I need to move, mention this issue here, simply because I haven't really found any other place in any of the other slides, in any of the other lectures, to discuss it. Of course, divorce is an issue that affects both men and women to a significant extent. Um, but I would like to just discuss it now because it is one issue where the church had a real um, hand, a real area of social and political authority. In Russian society. Now in this period, in the 18th and 19th centuries, divorce laws across Europe are generally becoming far more liberal. This is particularly the case in Protestant countries, but even in fervently Catholic areas of Europe. Case uh, annulments um, and so on and so forth were generally becoming easier to get. Not so for Russia, however. And largely that was because in Russia, Unlike almost everywhere else in Europe, the Orthodox Church maintained strict control, a strict monopoly of control indeed, over, the, over divorce. In other areas of Europe, divorce had become a secular matter uh, given to the courts or to government agencies. In Russia, it was controlled until 1917 by the Russian Orthodox Church. And the Russian Orthodox Church from the late 1920s 
18th until 18th century until 1917 proves inherently reluctant to issue divorces. Now there were fundaments, fundamentals in the canon laws that allowed bishops and the synod to give divorces. But the church was always reluctant to allow them in practice. Generally speaking, the church would, apart from in the most extreme of cases, try and preserve the marriage. We can see this with the kind of ridiculous criteria imposed for proof. So, for instance, under the canons, adultery was a legitimate reason for divorce. That is to say, if you cheat on your partner sexually with somebody else, that was a grounds for divorce. But the church demanded, as a level of proof, that two eyewitness, eyewitnesses had to see the act of adultery itself. In other words, two, eye two eyewitnesses had to see the act of uh, the sexual act between the cheating partner and the person outside the marriage before they would even consider allowing a divorce. And you can see this is absolutely uh, absurd. An absurdly high level of proof required precisely because the church was simply reluctant to give, uh, use adultery as a reason for dissolving a marriage. One of the very few areas where divorces were granted was when uh, one partner was exiled to Siberia, or one partner had maliciously and with deliberate intent abandoned the other. Divorces could, were often given in these cases. And uh, this is the, these the only real cases we see of divorce being issued in any numbers. Domestic abuse, in all of its forms, certainly was not, in the view of the church, a reason for divorce. Generally what the church did was it would try and advise the abused partner, who was uh, mostly the woman, to continue being obedient to her, her, um, her abusive husband, and perhaps live apart from him. And would, they would try and counsel the abuser. And of course, you can imagine, this, didn't, uh, this wasn't really a way of um, saving victims from their abusers. Now this has many, many negative consequences. Certainly it creates a great deal of human suffering, forcing people to remain together who were either completely suited, unsuited for each other or were, or were abusive towards one another. But it also has a very deleterious bureaucratic effect on the church. Divorce cases, divorce petitions, petitions for divorce, explode in number in the late 19th and early 20th centuries as conceptions of marriage and what is an ideal marriage and what isn't begin to change. And this means a huge amount of paperwork starts flowing into the church's bureaucracy. And it is an amount of paperwork that it is barely able to deal with. So I've given you a statistic here. In the 1850s, there were about 200 divorce petitions a year. By 1913, in 1913, there were 15,502 divorce cases. This was on top of a backlog of unresolved cases from previous years of 23,017 cases. Church bureaucracy, the wheels of church bureaucracy, were coming grinding to a halt because of the overflow of divorce cases. And I should also mention that annulments, in general, was quite rare in Russia. That is to say, the cancellation of a marriage 
because of reasons of uh, invalidity. The church again did everything it could to preserve the marriages that had been made. Then it ties when it would really act well where it were in extreme conditions. So, for instance, in cases of bigamy, that is to say, a man or a woman having uh, two marriage, par mar uh, marriage partners. Only in these kind of clear cut cases did the church really permit annulment. So, then in the second half of this lecture, we're going to now look at women in the church mentioned two senses. So firstly, looking at the women of the clerical estate, that's to say the wives and daughters of priests and other churchmen, and also having a look at the uh, nuns and abbesses. I know we already spent a lecture looking at monastics, but I feel it's necessary just to recap the main points from this more gender history perspective. And then we're going to have a quick look at church views on women in society and how these changed by the, by the Russian Revolution, leading to some fairly considerable changes in the church's position on the political, social and ecclesiastical roles that women could hold. So possibly the largest female group in the church were the wives and daughters of priests and unordained clergymen. By the beginning of the 19th century, priests and other members of the priesthood almost exclusively married women from the clerical estate. I've already talked in one of our earlier lectures about that, about why this was, but I'll go over it again. On the one hand, priestly fathers did not have a pension. And if they lacked sons, then they would marry their daughter to a seminarian, someone who's going to become a priest very shortly, concluding a deal with that seminarian that he would, go, he would come to the father-in-law's church and when the father-in-law retired, would continue to provide for him and his wife. In other words, the, new, the uh, seminarian would promise to provide for his new wife's family when they got uh, too old or too sick to serve in the church. On the other hand, the seminarians, the advantage of this was relatively obvious. By marrying the daughters of priests, they could secure themselves jobs. No small thing in um, the early 19th in the first half of the 19th century, when priestly positions were becoming fewer and fewer. This led to the phenomenon of bride shows. In, the in seminary towns, that is where priests would bring their daughters to be inspected by seminarians who would then make their choice, negotiate with the, with the, uh, with the father uh, about the terms of future service in his church uh, and marry the daughter. Now, for many women uh, of the clerical estates, the wives and the daughters, their lives were not too distinct from those of the men. They had to conduct agricultural work due to the poverty of the parish, due to the poverty of most parish priests, and engage in household tasks, and also contribute to the upkeep of the parish church, perhaps by cleaning it, or making repairs, or contributing goods for sale. It was not unusual, for instance, to find uh, priestly wives and daughters engaged in the baking of prosphora bread, a kind of bread used in the uh, Orthodox lit liturgy and also sold 
um, for use beyond the church doors. However, as the church in the 19th century became ever more concerned about the educational role of priests, in other words, that the priests should serve as educators of their predominantly peasant and poor flocks, the church also became concerned with the educational level and the moral qualities of clerical women, the wives and the daughters of the priests. For one thing, clerical wives should have a high level of education because they were going to be raising the next generation of priests. They had to be educated, in other words, so they could have a good intellectual and moral effect on their sons who would become the next generation of clergy. However, they also believed that the clerical, clerical wives and daughters could serve as helpers of the priest directly in his role as an educator, that they too could occupy uh, roles in, for instance, the parish school, educating these, uh, the peasant the children of the peasant parishioners. This was also matched by changes in the priesthood's self-conception. With its ever-rising levels of education, the priesthood came to view itself as a social elite, which indeed they were, at least in the context of most Russian villages. Certainly the most educated people um, usually the most educated people within the locality, even though their economic condition uh, usually didn't make them seem like much of an elite. With this growing self-consciousness uh, self as an elite, priests began to become ever more concerned with the education of their daughters. In other words, making sure your daughter was an educated person was a marker of your role. Uh, within, as, uh, as an elite. After all, this is precisely what the nobility did. So you had two factors by about the 1860s. The church's increasing demand on priests and their families to take an educational role in their parishes and the, priests, uh, and the priesthood's own rising self-conceptualization as an elite. This led to the establishment of what came to be known uh, as uh, clerical women's schools or clerical girls' schools. The first such one opened in 1843, a rather elite institution which was based in Tsarskaya Tsiela, the location of one of the Tsar's many residences. It's not very far from St. Petersburg. And given its uh, elite location, it's unsurprising to find that the imperial family and uh, had, a con had a conspicuous role both in the ch school's foundation and, and in its further development. The Synod also contributed rather significantly to this school. And this school was used as a model for the creation of um, a series of rather elite schools for the education of church or clerical daughters. There are about 11 by 1879, teaching just over a thousand pupils. However, these were rather limited institutions and were not certainly um, designed to cater to the entirety of the of clerical of clerical womanhood. The clergy themselves took care of this issue, establishing from the 1860s onwards, in almost every diocese uh, across the Russian Empire, what were known as diocesan girls' schools, aimed at teaching the daughters of the clerical estate, providing them with a degree of education. By 1914, there were 74 such schools in the empire, teaching just under 29,000 pupils. Now, for most, 
One of the distinctions of these diocesan schools compared to the imperial schools I just talked about earlier was that the diocesan schools were maintained almost exclusively on the account of the diocesan clergy. In other words, the clergy of each diocese would make contributions for the, pay, for the um, funding of these schools, and diocese and clerical congresses would decide or would appoint the staff, decide on certain policies for the schools, and so on and so forth. So they were purely clerical estate bodies. Now, to an extent, a lot of um, clergy were also expected to pay for their individual daughters to go there. So they had to pay fees, in other words, for their daughters to attend. But there was also a charitable role of these schools. In other words, the uh, orphaned girls from deceased clerical parents were given free admission into these institutions and also often given a uh, room, um, a bed and food within these institutions. And also the same goes for uh, daughters coming from very, very poor members of a diocese and clergy. Now, after some initial confusion about what precisely the program of these schools should be, what they should be teaching and how they should teach it, in 1868, the Synod devised a generalized curriculum to be applied across the Russian Empire. And possibly the most important focus uh, within this curriculum was on pedagogy. The expectation was that the girls graduate, the women graduating from, this estate, from these uh, classrooms, from these diocese and girls' schools, would either marry priests and then become teachers in their husband's parishes, or while they waited for marriage, they would take on roles as teachers in primary and secondary schools uh, in various locations. And indeed, a great many of these diocese and girls' schools offered graduates who had completed the full course of tuition teaching qualifications, so precisely they could take on a role in uh, primary and secondary education across the empire. This is precisely the church and indeed the state's goal. Clerical daughters were regarded to be uh, a conservative, religious, moral group who would be able to instill, who would be able to teach peasants and other poor social groups, not only things like literacy and numeracy, but also the basis of the Christian religion, Christian reality, and loyalty to the imperial order. Now, I just thought I'd give you this quote to show you. Actually, there was a sort of a debate in the early 18, in the 1860s, at least, about what kind of education these schools were offered, should offer. Should they offer academic education, or should they offer more grounded vocational subjects focused on the presumed, uh, on, the, on the pupils' presumed later lives? Now, I should just say before I get this quote, in 1860, uh, 1868, when the Synod announced its general program, its general curriculum for, for these dioceses and girls' schools, they, con they contained a mixture of both, of both academic subjects and vocational subjects, things like handicrafts, um, housework, which would include things like cookery and sewing and so on and so forth. But there were those in the uh, 1860s who really did fear, the, uh, fear that including academic education could alienate young clerical women from their, uh, from their roots. I'll give you a, he a quote here from Bishop uh, the Bishop of Nizhny Novgorod in 1866. And he argued, without a practical personal acquaintance with all kinds of labors in all parts of the home, female academic education, even if it is religious, could pamper the girls' organisms, wean them off physical labor. It could plant false shame about so-called black labor, i.e. housework, even in those pupils who on graduation from the school will have to live in the smoky and dirty peasant, ha peasant houses of their poor widowed 
mothers and fa mothers or fathers. So in other words, there were those in the church who believed that these schools should have an almost purely vocational stance. However, as I just mentioned, this wasn't the decision that the Synod came to in 1868. Now, generally, the diocesan uh, girls' schools was the highest level of church education offered to young women until, really, the beginning of the 20th century. And there was increasing support from a diverse range of church, of church circles for the opening of higher educa uh, religious, education, religious orthodox education for women. Even some conservatives in the church, normally in favour of limiting women's educational opportunities, supported this, largely because they believed that by giving clerical daughters and clerical wives this higher education, they would then be um, able to compete with the women in the radical secular intelligentsia, who often possessed um, university level education. So there were some small projects. I, uh, I don't want to overblow this. These were relatively small projects that never had more than a few, a, uh, a few tens of pupils. But nonetheless, there were projects launched in various church institutions to try and create higher courses of orthodox, of, for uh, higher courses of education for orthodox women. So, for instance, the Kazana Ecclesiastical Academy for seven years operated higher theological classes that women could attend. Between 1914 and 1916, there was a so-called theological pedagogical institute that taught about 60 women operating at a Moscow convent, for instance. Although it was, it, it was consist consistently denied uh, the status of being an institute of higher education. In other words, it couldn't issue certificates and, uh, and so forth uh, that were legally recognised by the state. And of course, this happens very late, and essentially the revolution forced it to close. Um, just to, as a brief aside, there were attempts in the early 1920s to create female um, uh, higher religious education courses by the church in Leningrad, i.e. what St. Petersburg became. But these, of course, were closed uh, during the oppression of the Orthodox Church, the persecution of the Orthodox Church in the late 1920s, uh, 1930s. Traditionally, in Christianity in general, not just Orthodox, well, traditionally increased in Catholic and Orthodox Christianity. Convents and female monasticism have provided a space for women in the church, a way in which women can take a more active participation in the rituals and religious life of the church, and indeed in some cases even rise to possess a degree of administrative and political authority within their local communities. As I mentioned, we've discussed this before, but I just want to give you a brief summary again within this, the context of this lecture. So convents and female monasticism offered several um, potentially attractive things to women, to orthodox women in Russian society. They were, it was a religious group of sisters that could give a real sense of community and togetherness. It um, the prohibition against sexual relationships and the lack of male involvement in their communities meant there was relief from childbirth, remember, an inherently dangerous and painful prospect in Imperial Russia, and offered also relief from Male, from the male abuse often characterised family life, particularly in the Russian countryside. Education could also be on offer in the schools operated by, often operated by convents. And indeed, one could take on a social, a role, a social role oneself as an educator, becoming a teacher or a nurse in the convent's educational and medical establishments. 
And to just underscore that, of course, there were religious motivations for joining a convent, not just material ones. Of course, the convents are often buildings and communities soaked in an atmosphere of the sacred and the divine. The conducting, for instance, of liturgies daily, of uh, daily singing, of a daily cycle of religious activities could prove attractive to pious Orthodox women. Female monasticism dramatically increased in Imperial Russia in the 19th century, particularly from the 1860s onwards. And indeed, by 1914, it was clear that female monasticism was far larger and was growing far more rapidly than its male equivalent. The reasons for this spectacular growth are, of course, all the normal reasons associated with the late 19th century. The abolition of serfdom had given women, uh, peasants in general, and in, in, indeed even women, the opportunity to move around the country more freely, not that they didn't need to seek passports or permission from, serf, from their landlords anymore. There was the transportation revolution, creating a train network crossing Russia, which allowed you to travel great distances relatively cheaply. There were increased liter uh, increasing literacy, ra uh, literacy rates in almost all spheres of Russian society, including, as we saw earlier, among peasant women. All of these factors come together to enable women who were previously unable to take a monastic career to, uh, now to enter into, into convents, or, uh, or indeed, in some cases, even to found convents. And of course, if one found monastic life to your liking, if one was able to rise to the ranks, you, be, you could become the abbess, the head of your convent. And this meant a significant, a, a significant role, uh, a significant responsibility for women, which they would not normally have possessed especially for women coming from the lower social orders, like the peasantry and the, and the townspeople. They would be able to exercise administrative uh, um, power over their own, administrative power and control over their own uh, commons. And they would, of course, take on a greater degree of cultural, uh, a greater cultural, and uh, social, and perhaps even political role in the towns and villages where their convents were based. So the convents could potentially prove a, um, a way for women to take a more active part in the church, and also, in some cases at least, to increase their social, uh, political and public role in Russian society. Now, by the end of the 19th century, the way in which the Russian Orthodox Church viewed women, their role in society, and their role in the church had began to change. To an extent, as we have to see. Now, there were, on the one hand, there were still always conservatives. People who took a very literal approach to things like, for instance, uh, the quote I gave you earlier from St. Paul in 1 Corinthians arguing that women should have no part in church life, apart from to stand silently at the back. And these are people who generally denied ideas of the uh, political, social equality of women, and who stood strongly for the support of a patriarchal family structure, where the man was in absolute control over his wife and his children. And this was, of course, a view which basically argued that women should be content with their domestic private roles in the household and should not seek wider social or political engagement. But on the other hand, we have more liberal reformist thinkers in the church who argue that there are 
both, firstly, there are both Christian and moral basis for female, basic, fundamental female equality with men, for female autonomy and for female self-fulfillment, and for a greater public role uh, for women. However, it should still be noted that for these thinkers, women were still regarded as being naturally domestic, naturally caring. There was an idea of, of um, women and men being equal, but also uh, complementary to each other. Men were public. Men were social animals whose job it was to be outside, earning money, money contributing to uh, the uh, social world. Whereas women, they were naturally uh, tender, caring, private, at their best in domestic life. As such, the expanded social roles um, for women argued for by these liberal reformist thinkers typically was limited to their um, to taking on jobs that were characterized by supposedly inherently female characteristics. So teaching, nursing, doctors, in some cases doctors, and so on and so forth. So in other words, while these thinkers stood for equality, autonomy, and a greater social role for women, it had some noticeable caveats. And they, along with the conservatives, rejected socialists or fairly radical uh, feminist projects at the time. For, for instance, a complete, uh, a, um, for the complete emancipation of women. And for their taking on politi role, political, social and cultural leadership. Now, one issue that became a sort of e a furious area of debate by the early 20th century, which characterized this question of what role women should take in the church, was the issue of deaconesses. Now, I mentioned earlier that St. Paul, in his letters, had noted that women had taken on ordained roles and were leading their religious communities as deacons or deaconesses. However, the institution seems to have died out after early Christianity, in no, no small part because Christian churches, I know especially the Catholic Church did this, was to, inter was to argue that the names of the women Paul mentions as deaconesses were not in fact women, but were names for men. And this was argued until really the revival of the massive wave of German biblical scholarship in the late in the 19th century when this uh, institution of deaconesses was rediscovered in Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox countries. Indeed, in case of some Protestant countries, was actually realized. Now, in the early 20th century, many reformer, reformist slash liberal church thinkers on the so-called women question believed that deaconess, the idea of deaconesses could be um, a perfect solution to giving women a greater role within the church, which nonetheless stayed within um, conceptions of femininity, uh, established conceptions of femininity. Of course, they were the one. The core issue really was over the matter of whether these individuals should be ordained or not. How much autonomy? from men should institution of deaconess, deaconesses have? Should they assume a leadership position? Now you can see here a photograph, this is a picture of Grand, of Grand Princess Elizaveta Fyodorovna, a member of the Romanov household who following the assassination of her husband uh, at the beginning of the 20th century became uh, a semi-monastic figure and was strongly in favour 
of the re of the creation of a autonomous um, institution of deaconesses who would serve as something like monastic missionaries. And she particularly tried to show this, get, to create an example of this through her own convent institution in Moscow, the convent of Martha and Mary. Now, when it came time to resolve on this issue in 1917-1918, the Church Council did, in fact, create deaconesses, but it did not allow them to become ordained. So in other words, they did not join the holy hierarchy of the Russian Orthodox Church. They were not given the right to dispense the sacraments. And they were, not also, they were also not given the kind of autonomy that people like Grand Duchess Elisabetta and others had required. They were still firmly kept under the control of parish priests. They were to be kept firmly under the control of parish priests and other male-dominated institutions. However, as with so many of the other resolutions of the 1917-1918 Church Council, the oncoming Bolshevik Revolution and the persecution of a church meant this was essentially became uh, the rulings of this council. This ruling became a dead letter. It was never realized in practice. And as far as I'm aware, still uh, is not practiced in the Russian Orthodox Church today. Here is one area where Russian Orthodoxy is, of course, distinct from, say, modern Protestant confessions like modern Lutheranism or modern Anglicanism, where in the Anglican Church we now have a female bishop. And I know there is already a, a relatively established tradition of female bishops in the Lutheran, in Scandinavian Lutheran churches, for instance. Now, the Church Council also made some other changes directly pertaining to women uh, in 1917-1918. One change was to allow women to become non-ordained members of the clergy, in other words, sacristians. So again, they were, this was very much allowing some expansion of the role and participation of women in church life, but still not allowing them into um, the more senior leadership roles within the clergy. The council su supported declarations of the provisional governments that women were equal in terms of their political and social rights. And it also, and it reflected this by arguing that women had um, equal rights of men in diocesan and parish management. So in other words, now, in, uh, for instance, in the, sort of, in the election of clergy that the church council allowed, women would have the vote, would have a vote in who became the new priest. However, the, um, the council did step back somewhat and said, well, although women may have the right to vote or the right to a say in certain aspects of diocese and management, they should not still be attending uh, meetings regularly or be a sort of members of the administration. Because the church, well, these churchmen argued generally that women were, quote unquote, too delicate to uh, possibly withstand the hurly-burly of administration. So again, we see there is some extension of women's roles, but there is still a limitation on the extent to which they are going to be allowed to take on administrative roles or positions of responsibility. So then, just to conclude this sort of very brief survey of women in Russian Orthodoxy at the end of the 19th and the beginning of 20th century, the changes that happen within the church reflect the growing emancip emancipation of women throughout the Russian Empire. Just as education is being ex offered um, at ever greater levels in the 1860s, so too to the clergy and to uh, a certain extent the synod take an interest now in educating clerical women. And there is greater and greater interest in having women assume roles as teachers, as doctors, both within the church and outside it. In one area in particular, female participation becomes extremely important 
and numerically significant. And that is in the flourishing uh, convent female monastic movement. And these new convents played an often vital social, um, social and charitable role within their communities. By 1917-1918, the church had come to the conclusion that women had to be offered more role within, the, within church life and had conceded the basic fact that women were politically and legally equal to men, a change made by the provisional government after the February, after the February Revolution and confirmed by the Bolsheviks in uh, November 1917. However, they were still reluctant to grant women leadership roles or positions of authority and responsibility within the church. This was a corollary of an abiding position, an abiding perspective on women and their qualities, a gendered perspective on women and their qualities held by both reformist and conservative church thinkers. That is to say that women were essentially, naturally more inclined towards the domestic sphere, that they were naturally more caring, naturally more tender, and that any extension of their political, uh, any extension of their roles into the church or wider society should reflect this. So they should become teachers and nurses. But since the, the, private, uh, the private sphere, the domestic sphere, was their more natural habitat, they should not seek to become political or social, or indeed, as we see, ecclesiastical leaders. And just again to finally note, again, this position on divorce. Divorce was an area where the church wielded absolute authority in Russia. And the fact that it issued so very few divorces in the imperial period led to many adverse consequences. Human suffering was certainly not the least of these adverse consequences, but also the church inflicted a huge burden on its own increasingly incapable bureaucracy. And many women, and men indeed, who had not been able to find a divorce from the Orthodox Church increasingly turned towards the old believers and sectarian preachers, hoping to find um, a more flexible approach to the question of marriage there. So in any case, that brings us to the end of today's lecture. I hope you found it all informative, and I will see you all um, in the next lecture. Goodbye.